afternoon and uh, it's a great honor for me to be able to talk at this meeting. Uh, we lost some time so I will try to speed up things. Uh, the, uh, when we talk about reju rejuvenation, there is much more than trying to turn ourselves younger. There are, there, are, there are other things that can improve our quality of life. And I think that's what the most important thing is as we age. Now, just to put my talk in, in perspective, uh, there are certain things that we're all aware of and familiar with that help us when we are in trouble. If we lose a limb, then we can have artificial attachments. Um, we can have uh, artificial organ machines. Those are not ideal. Sometimes they actually do improve our performance. This is a, a good example. We all know this individual. Uh, uh, but I think when, when it gets to something like this, this does not improve that much our quality of life, but, but, but allows us to survive. That's what, that's what it is. Now, this is not what I want to talk about. But this is what we are already familiar with, and those attachments and organ machines are getting better and better. When it comes to tissues and organs, we have made fantastic improvements and, and progress in the, in the last few years on organs that are either on the surface of our body, which is the skin, or organs that have very thin thickness. And Think about bladder um, uh, as a typical one, and um, uh, Dr. Yu will, uh, I'm sure, talk about that more. However, when we get to the point of solid organs, uh, we're still in trouble. And those numbers uh, uh, designate and show that the various, that the numbers uh, uh, correspond to people on the waiting list for various solid organs. This one is kidney. The numbers in the bracket show uh, by the end of 2000, 2013, how many transplants actually have been uh, performed. Uh, this is liver, this is heart, and this is lung. And as you can see, uh, the lucky recipients uh, lag far behind the demand. And this number, George Church already alluded to, this is the uh, the age of the longest living human on records, which I will return to later. So, uh, in order to mitigate this, that is to be able to make um, uh, solid organs, uh, there are several techniques that are in the, in the making. And one of them is, um, oh, this doesn't work. Is, is something like this. What well, would be fantastic if we could just print a heart. So that's, that's something that we're very far from. But bioprinting is this relatively new technology to make extended biological structures in principle, maybe one day, can lead us to something like that. But I want to emphasize that right now we're quite far from this. However, this technology can be used and in fact has already been used for uh, many other uh, applications, and uh, I, uh, uh, my, my group has, has contributed to this field, and we have developed our own bioprinting technology, which goes something like this. So you, you work with bioing particles, which are either spheroids, this is an uh, animation, uh, this is reality, either spheroids or uh, cylindrical buying units made of many millions of cells in our case the white stuff here is purely cellular material the blue one is an agarose that is just a supporting environment and you are laying down those discrete buying particles by the help of the printer according to some kind of a template the miracle happens in fact post printing and this is very important this process, contrary to three-dimensional printing that we hear so much about nowadays, is governed by biology. And biology already, of course, goes into the making of the, of the bioing particles, but even more importantly, it is biology that is responsible for structure formation post-printing. And this is a, one of the messages that I would like to bring across, that the bioprinting, there's nothing 
uh, miraculous about it, but bioprinter is a machine. And the process, to a large extent, is governed and controlled by biology. Okay, so once, this, this shows, by the way, the, 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 the manufacturing, the fabrication of a tubular organ structure, 70% you consist of tubes, and therefore, if we're able to make tubes by this technology, we would make a big step forward. So once, once uh, you have the structure, you let to mature it in, uh, under appropriate conditions. So this one is already pulsating because we put it in a, in a perfusion bioreactor. Then this organ uh, matures. And on the previous slide, you could see that this most spectacular event post-printing is the fusion of the discrete binding particles. And tissue fusion, because in our incarnation of bioprinting, the discrete binding particles are uh, mini tissues. It's their fusion that finally gives rise to the construct. Uh, in this particular case, um, this, is a, this is a vascular graft. And uh, we mature it. In that course of maturation, the construct acquires near physiological conditions or uh, parameters and, and properties. And here I just show you that um, uh, one of those parameters is, of course, which is very important for vascular graft, is the burst pressure, the pressure at which this um, uh, vascular graft will burst. Remind you that you're under healthy conditions, your systolic pressure is about 120, 130 uh, uh, millimeters of mercury. Uh, this particular one uh, can withstand already close to 1,000 millimeters of mercury. So uh, in principle, if this, is the, if this were the only a parameter that the surgeons looked at, it could be implanted. And in fact, some of the tubular structures that we printed, we did implant into, into um, laboratory animals. Okay, so one application of bioprinting is making those extended constructs and eventually the organoids. And at the end of the day, of course, the organs. But we are very far from that, especially when it comes to solid organs. So what, what, what is happening today, at least, uh, in, in, uh, in, in our uh, uh, incarnation of, of, of bioprinting. By the way, since we are talking about uh, cardiovascular, uh, this is a cardiovascular session, this is a, this is a piece of the bioprinted um, heart tissue. Uh, there you can see the, the tissue itself. This is after the fusion of the discrete binding particles. And here is the, the periphery. Uh, this, Construct was embedded in collagen. You can, if you watch carefully, it's uh, it's contracting. So the bioprinting itself, which starts from individual cells, putting them together into the bioink units, finally functionality is is maintained if those cells originally had this property of, of contractibility. As I said, uh, we can print tissues today but uh, we're so f far from, from printing full organs at this point. However, if you consider this number, and, we, uh, and if I tell you what this number is, I will also hopefully convince you that there are many other applications of bioprinting. This number, by the way, is the amount of money that uh, the global pharmaceutical industry in 2013 spent on research and development. And what is mostly this money spent on? It's spent on developing new drugs. Now, I have a 2011 chart, because there is no better one at this point, which shows that in 2011, this close to $60 billion produced 21 drugs that the FDA approved. Here, in 2011, 21 drugs. This is the point. That's an insane, on the surface at least, an insane amount of waste, because we spend uh, billions and billions of dollars and eventually we come up with 21 drugs. Of course, it's a long process. There are many, many years that went into this development of those particular 21 drugs, but that's every year seems that the, the cost is going up and the number of approved drugs is not improving, is not increasing dramatically. So what's the reason <clears throat> that we're spending so much money and we, we, we get uh, to relatively few drugs? Well, it's because drug development, of course, is expensive, but um, there's one step where most of those drugs bleed and, and turn out to be not useful. And it's when we go from preclinical animal trials to human clinical trials, uh, it turns out that, that close to sometimes, uh, 
sometimes some, according to some statistics, 50% of the, the drug candidates fail. And uh, well, we're just not animals, at least not most of the time. And uh, therefore, it's not perhaps surprising that, that many drugs fail when we go from the rodent uh, models to, to a human. Now, what this technology, bioprinting, and in general, tissue engineering could be very useful is um, to interface the animal trials with the human clinical trials. So if I engineer a tissue, a human tissue, that is functionally, architecturally uh, analogous to the tissue that we carry in our body, and I interface it between the, the, the preclinical animal trials with the human clinical trials through this tissue, I may learn a lot, and uh, if, it, if the drug doesn't work on that human tissue, there's a good chance that it's not gonna work in the full human. And so that's where this art is moving, and in particular, uh, well, actually, if we, uh, uh, if we uh, continue with this uh, uh, thought of uh, line of thought, then we can eventually even arrive at the situation when we can get rid of animal uh, animal trials at all, and that would be a very welcome fact for many of us who feel that uh, we abuse animals. So uh, this is, uh, you can think about patient-tailored drug development in its ultimate in this case, because if I take a few cells from your liver and then I grow them up in the lab, and hopefully they, those cells will still be characteristic for you, and I make this uh, liver construct and try a drug on them, on, on that construct, and if it works for you, then you're not going to be one of the statistics. And if, say, the drug is in 70% efficient, uh, that, that number doesn't mean anything for, to you. It, it, it may not work for you. And so this is the way we're moving towards uh, patient-tailored, ultimately, I think, patient-tailored drug development. Okay, so um, you can say, yeah, but uh, if you take just one, one, one tissue, that's not fully characteristic of the, of the organism, and that's why animal trials could be useful. But since we were able to make various tissues, and when I say we, it's uh, uh, my group at the University of Missouri and, uh, and the company that we, we um, founded around this idea by the name of Organovo, uh, we've been able to produce all kinds of tissues. And there are a, a sample, a uh, few of those. And if we interconnect them with the vasculature, and those are the tubes that I showed you at the beginning, we might get a kind of a of, a, of an organ, uh, set of organs that could mimic a more complex uh, structure than just one particular, one particular uh, tissue. So the most uh, sensitive tissue and organ to drugs is heart. But the second one is liver. And if we take liver and we take, uh, heart and lung and all the other uh, noble tissues and we put them together, uh, then there is a good chance that we will have a much better understanding of a particular drug in the, the case of a particular patient than just taking perhaps one tissue. However, right now this is in the, do, in the making and there are several groups in the country, uh, Harvard, uh, the famous uh, organ on the chip, uh, at Organ Oval, uh, the, the putting together the organs uh, through a, a vasculature, Again, a, an engineered vasculature, and uh, hopefully we'll get there. But right now, still, uh, the, um, uh, the, the most popular approach is to take a liver, uh, some kind of a liver construct, and test a particular drug on that liver construct. Now, there, this, this has been done uh, on liver cells. This has been done on two-dimensional liver models, but those are very far from the reality. And so um, uh, a few months ago, it was announced that Organovo produced a liver construct that can be maintained for over 40 days. And it uh, can be used and now it's been validated by, by some uh, pharmaceutical companies and key opinion leaders that this particular one, in fact, is a very good model for testing drugs, especially when it comes to their toxicity. So it's a three-dimensional construct, 
uh, close to a centimeter in, in lateral dimensions, a half a millimeter, or now it's even more um, in, in, in height. It's a truly three-dimensional uh, structure. It architecturally uh, resembles the, 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 the particular lobular, hepatic lobular structure of the liver. <coughs> it, uh, it secretes um, cholesterol. It synthesizes cholesterol, and it's the first time that that an engineered liver can produce that. It produces albumin over 40 days, not m much change, which is a, another signature of, uh, of the tissue uh, functioning properly. And the comparison between a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional tissue, in this case, that being the three-dimensional tissue, uh, is that, that um, in, in, in this particular case, albumin uh, production and synthesis is maintained, whereas in a two-dimensional tissue, after a few days, it disappears. So this liver construct is going to uh, hit the market, hopefully, before the end of the year. And uh, this is the first example where an engineered tissue, hopefully, will, will really provide something useful for the pharmaceutical industry uh, when it comes to drug development. So I talked about, ultimately, uh, perhaps printing organs. And then I said we have to come down from the high horse. Right now, we're, we're not yet there. We can, we can make tissues. And that's, I think that's already a, big, a great development. But then we asked the question, so here we have this technology. What else can we do with it? And I think uh, what I'm going to say in, 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 the, in the following fits very well actually what we've been talking about in the morning, that, <clears throat> that aging, the, 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 the causes of aging are not necessarily only uh, internal, that is given by our body, but we also contribute to it uh, by, by, by uh, destroying our own environment. So as we were thinking about what to do with this technology, we realized that when we chew on our favorite steak or wear our favorite leather jacket, those materials also are purely biological materials. They originate from a tissue. And if we can do, if we can make medical grade tissues, we should be able to do something also here. Now, uh, leather is a byproduct of the meat industry. The meat industry is one of the most polluting industries out there. And there's no representatives of the meat industry here. So I think I can say uh, those words without too much trepidation. Uh, I don't know how many of you know that when you eat your quarter pounder, this is what goes into your quarter pounder. It's insane. I and mean, if we continue that way, the prediction is that by 2050, we will have destroyed a considerable part of our own environment. And that's really true. And if you think about it, that we are polluting, just the meat industry is polluting our environment because it releases about 18 to 20% of the greenhouse gases nothing else, think about cow poo. What, we do, what, what do we do with it? So, so this is clearly not sustainable, and uh, more and more of us realize that indeed something needs to be done. By the way, interestingly, the meat industry itself realizes that this cannot continue forever. And in particular, the prediction is that by 2050, we will be about 9 billion on Earth, from seven billion that we are in right now, and, uh, and, the, and the number of land animals who share the same resources that we need uh, will hit about 100 billion. And if you think that by that time, everybody in China is going to eat steak, you can imagine what consequences that would lead to. So we asked uh, the question, is there anything we can do with this technology about that? And so we, um, we made meat with this technology, we, because if, if, uh, if we could do the leather and the meats in, a, in, a, in an ethically, environmentally, more conscious way, uh, we, would, we would greatly contribute to the preservation of our, our scarce resources. So we can do that. And um, uh, I know that this might sound Frankensteinish to some people, but in fact, I think there is no, no other choice for us. So in the long term, we'll have to do something like that. We will have to produce our own resources, our own food uh, by some other means that we're doing it right now. Now, when I say that we can do that, what do I mean by that? 
So the process by which we uh, culture meat is that instead of killing the animal, we source the cells from a cow, a few million cells through a biopsy, grow up the cells in the lab, print the construct, I'll show you in the next slide, make it into a layered construct, um, kind of a hamburger, if you wish, but there are many other things that you can do with it. Uh, once the construct has matured, and in this case, of course, you're working with muscle cells, uh, you prepare your food item, and then you bring your chef, and your chef will, will make it yummy. So there are about two groups, I think, in the universe right now doing this crazy thing. One of them is in, uh, in Holland, and by the way, those people last year revealed a hamburger, a true hamburger. True, the price of that hamburger is $300,000, so we're not necessarily there yet. And maybe that's not the best product to, to start this game with. So this is how it works in, in our, at least when, when we want to build a, a carpaccio or a layered um, meat product, it's the same kind of uh, bioprinting that we can apply to making biological uh, or medical uh, great tissues and organoids. And um, so there's nothing Frankenstein in, in, in itself in this. Uh, it's just that the notion of, of, of meats produced by this method might sound very weird to many people. Although there are all kinds of studies that have been already performed among vegetarians, for example, and interestingly enough, vegetarians, many of them at least, would gladly eat this product, <clears throat> uh, but they won't, uh, the ones that originate from the animals. Okay, so the product that we came up with, and it's not at this point what we have, is a meat chip, and uh, there are people already at this conference, some of, uh, some of, some of whom uh, tasted it, uh, I, I have one with me, so I can show it to anybody who is interested in it. Uh, unfortunately, you won't be able to eat it. One, it, it looks exactly like a, a potato chip, just tastes very differently because it tastes like meat. But, um, but obviously, this doesn't cost uh, $300,000. It still costs about $100 today. And uh, we uh, organized a, a, a tasting event, and I can tell you that it was very, very successful. And so this may be a product that in a few years you will see in the, in the supermarket shelf. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you about bioprinting. But before I, I close, I want to get back to this because I want to leave you with a certain message. So ultimately, this would be our goal. Print a heart, a liver, a lung, and, and, and make you a happy camper and then you live forever. Now, I, I personally don't believe that we will ever be able to print the same heart that you carry in your body. And simply because that is the result of many millions of years of evolution, and uh, I see very little chance that we can reproduce, reproduce it exactly that way. But, and so this might be the, the bad news. But the good news is that I don't see any reason why a heart made of your own cells must be like this. Nobody tells us that this is the best. This is, this is very good, there's no question about that. But as it was evolving, uh, we got better and better engineers. So we can make a, a fantastic pump today, and if we make it from your own cells, and this is the most important message that I wanna convey to you, it has to be made from your own cells. So make an organ that functions exactly the same as the heart, but doesn't necessarily resemble it to its many details. And so I believe that, that, um, that this organ printing, as it is called, uh, has a chance to move in that direction. And one day, maybe, uh, you will just uh, walk into a specialized clinic, shed some of your uh, cells, and the technician will make you an organ to your measure. Thank you very much. That's really basically the message that I wanted to convey to you. So before I really disappear, of course, I have to thank to my students. It, 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 it is with, with, with great satisfaction that I show you this slide because 
The one that chose Organovo in 2008 started out with a few people, and now it's a, a, a publicly traded company with 50, over 50 employees. Um, and uh, the one that is making the, the, the animal products came about um, in 2011, and now it has about 12 employees, and that's a great satisfaction to a scientist to see that something that was made at the bench may eventually hit the market and can be useful beyond the lab. Thank you.